The youngest child in a family of sugarcane growers, Sean had always wanted from a young age to become a pro golfer. And after failing his year 12 exams, he wouldn't think that a career in physiotherapy would be on his radar. So how did Sean turn this situation around? Well, welcome to Physio Plus 10. Today's guest is Associate Professor Sean O'Leary. Sean, thanks very much for joining us today. I'd really start these questions up with the first and most obvious one, which is why did you want to become a physio? Well, thanks, Doug, for having me on. Um, I, well, really, my first experience of what a physio was was when I had a sore knee at, when I was at school. And um, I never had any intentions of going to university, even at that stage. And um, I, I thought, like a lot of kids who were playing golf at that age, that I was going to be a professional golfer. And there was a very distinctive moment when I, when I played in a Queensland schoolboys championship one time when I, I played with a fellow who... Um, was 15 and he hit two balls out of bounds and still shot one under half of the day. And I remember thinking, well, if that's how good you've got to be, I better go back home and think about a, a different career <laughs> because I was never going to be that good. So I, um, I, I, yeah, I had patellofemoral pain at the time. And I was, I went to a physiotherapist in Innisfail from where I'm, where I'm from in Falmouth, Queensland. And I thought, well, this would be a good job. And, uh, I'd failed school miserably at that stage because I was too busy playing golf and I went back and repeated grade 12 and um, from being a totally non-dedicated student, student to a really dedicated student when I repeated grade 12 and got into human movements and then as was my plan got into physiotherapy from there. Okay so just just walk, walk us back a bit there you were really serious about your golf. Oh very serious yeah very serious I I I think I played golf every day for five or six years and, and that was, you know, um, uh, and so I, that, that was what I was trying to do. Um, but yeah, it's lots of kids are trying to do that <laughs> at some point. You it's gotta, funny you say that story because one of the guys I was going to school that at Bustle Senior High School, he was, a, he was a really big truant and he, you know, his, his um, place of truancy was the golf course. But he went on to become, yeah, he's a he's a pro golfer and he's done very well for himself on the international scene. So, I guess some guys make it and some don't really. Oh yeah, and and it's interesting. And you you play the schoolboy golf, and you know the some of the players are just phenomenal. You know, a, a very young, but but very few of them actually make it. You know, the uh, very big. Uh, you know, it's um it's interesting. There's a lot to it than more to it than just talent of course <laughs> yeah. And, yeah there's the dedication and mental capacity for it and you know and all that and so yeah that was um so that was how I sort of turned my academic career around I guess because I was never I wasn't academic at all and I I um I really did fail terribly grade 12 the first time and I had a friend who had got a you know the highest tertiary entrance score that you could get and I went to her when I repeat, when I decided to go and repeat grade 12 and I asked her how to study and she said, I can't believe you've made it to grade 12 and you don't know how to study. <laughs> All that hidden talent. <laughs> and, 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 uh, she said, this is what you do. And it was basically rote learning, you know, that she taught me and, and I did that and that worked extremely well next year and worked well in my initial years at university, interestingly enough. And this is, yeah, I have a big interest in clinical reasoning now. And, and how you teach clinical reasoning. And, and um, I, I remember I got to my third year of physio and, and I, I, I was doing well and I was, did honours and I, I, and I studied the hardest I'd studied in this first semester in third year. And I, and I really didn't get very good marks at all. I passed, but they weren't very good. And I remember going to see a, you know, a, a, long, a, a long-standing um, member of the physiotherapy department, Robert Cupid, at that stage, and you know, I said, Robin, I can't work it out. I've studied this much harder than I normally did have, and uh, and I've I've done worse than I normally do. And she said, Well, tell me how tell me how you study. And I explained to her this rote learning, and she said, Well, that that's not going to work anymore. <laughs> she goes, It's all it's all about problem solving now. And so this is how you're going to go about it. You're going to look at past questions. You're going to think about cases. You're going to problem solve and try to put all the bits together. And, and work it out. And so um, that was m one of my very early um, occasions where I realized, well, it's all about clinical reasoning and putting the parts together and making sense of making sense of all the information. And so um, 
and that, and that 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 therefore after that i yeah started to get back on track with that yeah. it's interesting there's quite a turning point in the strategies of learning that got you so far and then could get you no further mm. yeah. Right. yeah so again just jumping back a little bit like you said you got interested in physio because of your patellofemoral pain were any of your parents in the health sphere no i'm from a sugarcane farming family so my father um and his brother ran a sugarcane farm and um and you know i i was the youngest of four kids uh my my brother or my two sisters uh, no one finished senior um and I, I was a bit younger than them but, you know i think it's, it's a generational thing in that i think when my you know brother and my sisters were at high school um there really wasn't an expectation that anyone had probably go to university we all had the opportunity to if we wanted but it re really probably wasn't on the radar um for for them they didn't think about that they you know, um I, and I didn't either, as I said before, you know, I didn't even think about it, but I, I was also fortunate enough that when I was at school, I, so, you know, some friends were going to university and um, that sort of as well sparked my interest that, gee, that might be a fun thing to do. And hmm. it's been great. Yeah. And I'm not sure of the I'm geography. Still at, still at university. Yeah, I, I was going <laughs> to <gonna> say, <laughs> you might've started late not knowing you're going to do it, but you're still digging in there now. Um, yeah, that's it. I'm not sure the geography of uh, Queensland, but is Innisvale is that? Would do you have to have go to a boarding school and residential college to study? Uh, well, for school, no. Um, I went to yeah you know, Innisvale State High, which was 20 kilometres down the road. Yep. Um, certainly, when I went to university, though, I and I came to the University of Queensland in Brisbane. I, um, I that was when I left home and and came down, and I I lived at a Emmanuel College, which is on the um, uh, on campus at UQ, it's one of the co-ed colleges, and that and that was an amazing. Uh, that, that was one of the greatest things I did in my life was actually go to a residential college where I lived at, at university because a lot of the people that I still see and I and I catch up with are people that I went to college with. Yeah, um, you're all living together and you're young and you're you know on the same boat and yeah. So no, university for me was a great experience and from that perspective yeah i think that's in talking to our kids that, that their formative years those first two or three years at uni if you've got a residential college and you've got that combination it seems like uni's changed a little bit now it's a lot more watch your lectures online at one half speed and you know get the exam papers from the year above you to try and make it easy so they're kind of losing that um fraternity that sort of learning and being together which i valued so much as a physio that does seem to have changed a fair bit it's it's true and it is a changing face of university and um because you know me and my wife who often speak about this so my wife's a physiotherapist but she trained in england and she was at residential college as well and speaks as fondly about that experience as i do and we we said gee if our kids go to university in brisbane here they'll probably just live at home which a lot of people didn't they had a great time as well but so they, they won't have that experience, but university courses are so different now with a lot more, even before COVID, a lot more sort of moving towards a lot of online that, that maybe the experience isn't the same. I don't know. I'd have to speak. Yeah. A lot of students are still going to residential colleges and seem to enjoy it at this stage as well. So yeah. Anyway, I think, yeah. So what other things do you time. remember? Sorry. Sorry, mate. No, no. That's no, I was going to ask you what other, I mean, other than that sort of, um, I guess, turning point for you to realise your learning strategies had to change. Was there anything else that hallmarked your undergraduate years for you? Yeah, well, very much uh, being happy that I was in the right profession. I always, um, you know, one of my great professional mentors is, you know, Professor Gwen Jull and, and you know, I met, always tell a story about, you know, um, you do all these different aspects of physio in your courses, you know, and we, in third year, we suddenly were going to these lectures on musculoskeletal conditions. And I remember, you know, I distinctly remember Gwen's lectures back then. And, I, and we didn't know who she was really and her, you know, her status in the profession and worldwide. and you know, you're just an undergrad and 
you're attending these lectures and you've seen this lady around before and yeah you know, and suddenly here she is but i remember sitting there and listening to her lectures and thinking ah yeah this is i'm in the right place here uh, that's um and again that i think you know i've thought about well, what was it about those lectures? And yeah, and it was the challenge to problem solve. It was the challenge to clinically reason, to work it out. Yeah. You know, that it's just one sort of thing you do, but it's, it's, it's problem solving. And that's, that's to me, the, the linchpin of, you know, progression through physiotherapy education and physio and, and through your career is that, you know, that progressive ability to problem solve and on your, on your feet with a patient, um, and I, I see clinical reasoning as, a, as an enormously important thing to focus on in education. And, and it's only been in recent years of sort of started to look at, you know, that there are ways that you can specifically target um, clinical reasoning development, you know, um, as opposed to just expecting that it'll, it'll naturally progress. You know? Yeah. Because you can know a lot of knowledge, but you don't necessarily use that. You, you might not use that knowledge as effectively if you don't contextualize that knowledge into, into what it means clinically at the time with the patient and being able to problem solve as you know, each new bit of information is gained from the patient, being able to, you know, in the background, be thinking, well, what does that mean? How does that change things about what I'm thinking? And, you know, um, that reflection in action, they call it. Um, which is one of the types of reflection. <laughs> Now, what happened like when you've, you've graduated and you've got your first paycheck and you're now a certified physiotherapist, what did that mean to you when you first realized that now I have achieved this goal? Oh, I was just very happy to, you know, to, to finally go and work as a physio. And I, I wanted to have a break from living in Brisbane and my sister had uh, worked in a small mining town, well, a big mining company, but it's a fairly small town called Billawheela in central Queensland. And she'd worked there many years ago. And she said, you'll have a good time in Billawheela. <laughs> and so I, uh, I, my first job as a physio was at Billawheela in central Queensland. And, um, and I, uh, you know, I had a great time. I was there for 12 months. The other physiotherapist was another new graduate that I was in my year. And so we were two new graduates working in this um, uh, town, I think 6,500 people, I think. And so, but we used to look after th um, three other small hospitals, um, Bralabar, Mara, and Theodore hospitals. That we, so we drive around to these other small hospitals and we take turns. And, and you know, we had, I was always, always wanted to be a musculoskeletal physio. And, and it was great because we would go and see the inpatients for an hour or so in the morning. And, um, and then it would be all musculoskeletal afterwards. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a hard training ground in that we were these two new graduates there and, you know, we were the only ones. And I think there was a chiropractor in town, but there were no other physiotherapists. There weren't any private physios. And so it was really, you, you had to see everything. And, and um, I think some of the most complex patients I've ever seen were in that first year. I could, or maybe I just remember them because, uh, I, you know, that, and, and that, and that feeling of helplessness when you don't quite know what to do <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's not all working like you might have thought it did when you were um when you were at university and so i do remember that it was a great time but it was a great training ground for for physio as well and what happened after that did you do a couple of years on that sort of process no i i spent 12 months at Bilawila, uh and then i um went and um Spent two years in England, uh, just doing locums. Like I think probably ninety percent of my year were over there, and you know it was the well. I think it's re-emerging a little bit. Well, COVID's affected, of course, but now, but yeah, you know, certainly back in the early nineties, yeah, you know, it was a very common thing to go and spend your two years or more uh, in England, and yeah, you know, it was terrific because I worked at so many different venues around England, and and yeah, you, know, you could take three months or more off and just go and travel Europe and then come back and say, I want a job in the North. And, you know, so I worked all over England, a bit of Wales and, and did lots of great travel. And, and that, that was, that was fantastic professionally too, because you just work with so many people and different walks of life and different sort of, you know, you know, different bents on 
practice. You know, I worked in places where it was all about McKenzie, you know, and mm-hmm. then I worked in some places where all the beds were pushed up to the wall and they were all doing acupuncture, you know, and then I, and it was all just a great experience to see how, you know, people went about these, how different physios went about things and based on their training and everything. So, yeah, so that was a great two years um, to do. And, and as, as so many Australians and New Zealanders have and vice versa with, you know, people from the UK coming to Australia and having similar experiences. And I'm guessing this is where you met your wife or not? No, no, no. I met my wife many years later when, um, and uh, when she came to Australia and, and uh, uh, to, to undertake her master's degree. And um, so that was, yeah, well, well after that. Okay. 2005, it was, yeah. yeah. So what happened? What was, what was happening next once you, you'd done your two years of European tours? You made a key decision about something then? Well, you know, doing a master's in muscular skeletal was always in my radar and um, I was always going to do that. And I remember as an undergrad, you know, of, um, seeing the master's students at UQ and thinking, yeah, I'm probably going to go that way. Yeah. But I wanted to go out and have a you know, few years experience. And so when I came back, I went back up home for a while. And I worked in private practice, um, you know, very busy practice actually in Cairns for probably, you know, it was about eight or 10 months. And then I, I thought, well, why don't I just do in Australia what I did in England? And so I, I drove around Australia for two years doing locums, um, predominantly in private practices, but also in public hospitals. And so I, and it was easy. It was so easy. I would just ring ahead and I'd have two or three jobs, you know? So mm. I, I went to Darwin for six months and then I went to Alice Springs for about four or five months and, then I went to um, the next place I worked was in Broome for about three or four months. And then down close to you, Doug, I was at Albany. I, was, I worked at Albany Hospital for a few months. And then I finished off at, in Perth, at um, Royal Perth. So uh, again, just all musculoskeletal, mix of private practice and, and, um, and uh, public health. And, and I finished at Shenton Park, actually. I was at Shenton Park. Um, there at, at Perth um, in 1999 um, before I came back to to Brisbane to do my masters. So that was a great experience as well. So I was a bit of a gypsy for a long time with work. Yeah, you had a good <laughs> four or five years there where you're all better weren't? <laughs> moving around. Did you like when you were over here in Perth, so to speak, in the Shannon Park? Is that did you come across Bob and Pete and those guys in those days? I look, I knew all of them and I was reading lots of stuff about them. And, and I, I remember seeing, um, Bob LV once and I, um, I was, uh, what's the, what's the campus in the city, Victoria, um, He's South Perth one or, uh, in the middle of the city, the Perth hospital campus in the middle of the city. I can't remember. Anyway, the, the master students were there and he was tutoring them. And I remember sitting there listening and because I'd heard about him, a lot and um you know uh people like Gwen and Bill and you know I remember them talking about Bob Elvey and as well and and um and I I, I sort of was treating patients but I was trying to listen to what he was saying to the, the master students as well and and um so yeah I I had a great time in Perth uh, and uh I you know Peter O'Sullivan was doing a lot of his great work early work at that stage and that's uh yeah had a fantastic time yeah now, professionally, you seem to have two main two main themes, kind of, to what you have been focusing. One is your clinical, and one is your research. If we start looking at the clinical stuff, you talk about undertaking your masters in Musk. Why was this such a big thing for you? Like, why did you decide to follow that theme up? I reckon I've got three main things. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's clinical, clinical teaching, uh, clinical research, and teaching. Um, okay. I, I, yeah, look, I, as I was saying before, going and doing musculoskeletal masters was always on the radar for me. It was just when and where and I did it. And um, I, I, if I was going to stay in physiotherapy, which I never really doubted I would, I, I really wanted to do everything I could, um, all the progressions that I could 
And so the, the masters in musculoskeletal, which, you know, I'd had lots of people I'd worked with had, had done their course and I'd worked some places where the students were and it was always something I, I wanted to pursue just to try to improve my, my clinical skills um, and, and become as, you know, um, advance my skills as much as I could at that stage. And you chose UQ. Was that a thing like I wanted to return home or were you flipping the coin between Curtin and UQ? Yeah, I, I was looking at both Curtin and UQ and both, uh, you know, were excellent courses at that stage as they are now. And um, I, and I I could have stayed at, um, at Curtin as well that next year. But I, I by that stage, I'd sort of had two years of travelling around mm. and I thought, ah, oh, I'm just going to, it's, in many ways, it's just going to be easier to go back to Brisbane, <laughs> you know, then, and, uh, and I went back to Brisbane, but, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I would have been happy having been at either of those courses, such excellent people working at both, you know. So, um, yeah, I went, come back to UQ. And what did you, what were the main things you learned both, I guess, professionally and non-professionally from your course at UQ in Musk? Yeah, look, yeah, and I think you come out of a master's that, knowing that there's still an enormous amount to be learnt. You know, I think there's this misconception sometimes, and I probably was thought the same, that, you know, you go and do your master's and that means you come out as this excellent physiotherapist who can treat everything. And, you know, but it, really, as a lot of students will say, you know, you come out of your master's um, knowing that there's a lot more grey, you know, areas than, than, than known and, and, I guess the thing that I enjoyed from the masters that I got out of the masters clinically was a bit more of an appreciation of why things might be progressing the way they're progressing in a patient. The masters it was seen as this hallmark, you know, of getting there and finishing that. And then you've, you know, you might, you might have this status as a, a really good physiotherapist. Well, it was very different for different people because people in a master's course all come in at different levels. And, you know, there's a threshold of practice you've got to have obtained and that before you come into the masters. But there are some people in there who have been treating patients for 20 something years. And there's some who've been treating them for three. And, you know, so people come in these different levels, like, you know, different types of experiences, walks of life. And, and so everyone doesn't come out at this same level, you know, but the, but the thing is, and this is the thing I always say to people think about their masters, every one of them comes out a lot more informed than they were before they started the course. And that's the important thing is that there's this learning that happens through the course, no matter what level you start at, and people are much more informed at the end of the course, uh, which is the great thing about it. And, and hopefully a lot more equipped to go on to be, you know, a, a self-regulated independent learner from that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's the um, concept about the grey zone is very important because it's not black and white. And just because you've done a master's, it really is, it almost sets you up to realise, hey, yeah, you don't know as much as you thought you did. And you realise there's a lot of context you've got to still put in place. And that really comes back from those years and years of the experience of treating patients. Yeah, no, I, I was more saying that it, it's... it's um... It's almost it was it's reassuring though when you when you better understand that there can be a lot of things that can impact how someone goes. There's a, those grey areas, and so I was more saying that it's it's reassuring that um, you know I, I remember feeling a bit more reassured after I did my masters that there's a lot more to this, and so yeah. you know if a patient's not responding the way I think I should that, that they should be it, it might it might just be that they're a very complex problem a bit more complex than and, and the picture mightn't be as clear. So now we're um, talking more the biopsychosocial concept as opposed to perhaps just the biological. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's it. Yeah. 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 Following your postgraduate training, um, you, you know, you reckon this is, the, this is the hardest bit for me. Like the postgrad was challenging. Well, mine was postgrad, yours was master's, but it's then actually stepping into the specialization process that I found ex exceptionally challenging and somewhat daunting. So how did you find that process and why did you do it? Well, again, I guess it was always, it was a no brainer for me. I was always going to do it once I, you know, um, 
had spent some years after masters and yeah the the process was very much up and running again um the specialization process and you know it was something that i i was definitely going to do and it just was a matter of finding the right time and that was in you know 2008 and um so it, it, it again yeah it, it was it's a humbling experience the specialization process particularly i think where you start to in the practice of it you with your cohort and you know your peers you start watching each other treat and that's a great experience to do it's very humbling though as as everyone finds out because it, you know you it it takes time to learn how to do that too with people watching i think in that you know when you're just treating by yourself in your cubicle you sort of do what you think you should do and you work it out when you've got people watching you suddenly you're thinking gee you know what they'll be expecting me to be doing this this and this so i better <laughs> i better do that but that might not make sense for what your patients got and and I, I think part of that process you know where we all just watched each other and watched each other and watched each other and got used to and and got used to just going right i'm just going to do my job here um i yeah that was that was quite daunting together with all the theoretical knowledge aspects of it and all the bits and pieces that come with it but um yeah it was the greatest thing i've done in my physio career though i think specialization it was it was a yeah i i've grown yeah it's been tremendous when you when you just were saying that about the way you change your practice to suit the audience so to speak it just made me think i was reading an article on brain development because i'm looking at it from a sleep perspective and they sort of say in the very early early years of development our brain is like a it company just laying out a massive name a massive amount of fiber network cable through a new development say and then as we get a bit older instead of laying down more and more cable it starts to strategically reinforce the cables that we want and prune back the cables that we don't want. And I suddenly thought that's a good analogy for the specialization because you, you think you just get, you're there to do everything, to do it all properly. But really the crux of the specialization is to understand what everything is to be done and then only doing what's necessary based upon the conversation you have with your patient and that clinical reasoning process that you're working through. So you, you're constantly pairing back and you're really trying not to do anything which is not necessary or you're just not doing it for the sake of, oh, I should do this. There's actually a, a reason why you included something, but there's also a reason why you excluded something. And that sort of, that, that, that sort of network process just jumped into my mind as a bit of a picture. So were there any hitches in your preparation and getting ready for the examination of specialization? No, I don't, I don't think there were any hitches. I had a great group I was working with um, that we were all going through the process at the same time. And, and I think we're all very sensible and, and like that, you know, uh, it's interesting what you're just talking about, you know, what it, what it is actually, what people might think is and what it is. One of the things that struck me about the specialization process and, and watching specialists in practice is that it's not about doing anything flashy. You know, it's about doing, it's about doing the, the fundamentals really well and, and, and getting, you know, questioning the patient well, getting all the information that you can to be able to provide them, you know, very tailored advice and education. So, and, and, you know, while it's, while it's informed by research, you know, it's not necessarily dictated by research what you do. And, and really you have to have all that information and knowledge, but just see what the patient in front of you needs and requires. And, and um, you know, and that's where you get into trouble in specialization. If you, if you, you know, if you've gone down a management pathway and you're being asked to explain it, if you, if you can't explain it based on what you saw with the patient, and, you know, and you're just trying to base it on some literature, but that didn't really suit the patient, then <laughs> yeah, you're in a bit of trouble. Um, and so it is about doing the basics really well, um, which, and, um, which, which is refreshing, I think. Um, I, I also found it too, I, I had become very, uh, I guess, impairment driven a bit in my practice at that's before I did specialization. It's partly reflecting a lot of the research I was doing around muscle impairments and, you know, and I think um, 
I, I become quite impairment focused. And while impairments are you know, a very important thing to consider and to rehabilitate or whatever it might be, what specialization uh, did for me con consistently with all patients was to actually spend more time listening to you know, what their key aggravating and you know, aggravating factors are or their functional deficits and you know, really taking time to explore those in the examination. You know, and then you know, looking at impairments, but looking at it from the perspective of what does that mean for how they've presented functionally and with their aggravating factors. And it, it's, it changed the way I sort of tried to think about how I systematically go through um, you know, examination. And, and back then, I think uh, you know, before specialization, I sort of did that well in some patients and terribly in others. And I think that was, you know, uh, that was to the detriment of my practice because I wasn't sort of able to provide them with immediate advice and education well enough or, you know, some things that could have really helped them that I'd missed because I hadn't asked enough information around what the key things that they have problems with or the key things that aggravate and, and try to problem solve from there. I had more just jumps towards looking for impairments can you explain that a bit more or give an example when you say an impairment, what would be a classic thing yeah. you get caught on? Yeah. Yeah. And look, I see this all the time uh, when you're watching clinical exams at master's level and sometimes at mock fibers with specialists and that is that they'll get to the behavior of symptoms and they'll say to the patient, you know, what aggravates your you know, back pain or neck pain or whatever. And for example, they might say, oh, it's, look, it's sitting. You know, sitting at what, you know, oh, sitting where, yeah, you know, how long, oh, yeah, you know, after 30, 40 minutes, whatever. And they'll leave it at that. And they won't go into the detail that's required to actually know what it is about sitting with that person or whatever functional activity or aggravating activity we happen to be talking about. They won't go in enough detail and say, well, look, is it sitting anywhere or sitting at home or at work? Does it matter what chair you're on? Does it matter how you're sitting? Is it more around that you try and sit too long at once or is it about the position that you're in or tell me about the set you know when you go into that extra detail then you can provide you, you can then take that to your physical examination get them to mimic it as best they can say show me show me how you sit so you know i, I want to see if i can understand it and if you go to that detail of, of asking enough questions in the patient interview then taking that to the physical examination and, and exploring it then often you have so much more insight as to what you might be able to, what advice you might be able to provide the patient that's very specific to them and that their situation. And if you don't do that well, then people are left with very generic um, uh, approaches. And so they might start teaching them something about sitting that really isn't a problem for them because you know, it's something else about sitting. And, and, and you see this in the exams and they'll give a treatment and you'll go, why did you do that? I, I didn't even hear you ask the patient about that. They didn't report that to be a problem, but you're addressing it. That that wasn't their key problem. Why would you do that? You know, and what tell, tell me about the characteristics of their aggravating factor that you know might need addressing, and, and they can't give you the detail. And so the carryover that has to the rest of the physical examination is that it becomes a bit more of a data collecting test sort of scenario instead of being really purposeful where they're now looking for, you know, they're now examining the articular muscular neural systems, about a sensory system, whatever it is, in a way that's trying to help them better understand what the patient's been reporting as their key problem. Hmm. You know, they've got a purpose to it. And this is what you're saying about, yeah, prioritizing examination and it, working out what's, what, you know, which of these impairments are actually meaningful, you know, that, that then drives a very good examination, a purposeful examination, you know, rather than if you don't take that detail at the start, then you really are just testing things. Yeah. So would you say the subjective is almost, is more, almost where you get 90% of your decision-making process occurring and 10% of your objective is like to confirm it? Yeah, well, I, I, well, both are imp very important, of course, and, and both sort of marry together to, to try to make sense and justify hypotheses that, that certainly in the patient interview, you know, a really good patient interview should be able to give you information that you can help someone straight away.
Mm, without absolutely. you know without even playing your head being able to give them the appropriate advice and education and then of course it gives you your this is the clinical reasoning the reflection in action it gives you your running hypotheses about what might be the diagnosis about what might need to be met uh, um, given for management or what might need to be a priority in examination you have those things running in your mind and, and after your patient interview, then you can take that to the physical examination and, and see whether that, what you find then is consistent with what you were thinking. Yeah. And so that, um, yeah, I, I, that, that to me, that was another, that very much the specialization process cleaned um, me up from that perspective. Um, <laughs> uh, where I was, wasn't doing that well with a lot of patients, I think. Oh, that's good. Um, so you've, you've stayed on with the specialization pr process too. Like you completed this. When did you do your, when did you do your specialization? 2000 and 2008. Yeah. Eight. yeah. Okay. And so you're now with the college of physiotherapists, which is like the, I guess, administrative arm and the, the organizer of the specialization process. What is your role there now? Yep. Yeah, so I'm in the college council. It's my second uh, term, my second time I've been a college council. I was in the college council, um, you know, many years ago, I think it was 2009, 2010, Pete Fazy was the chair back then. And, um, and then I, I've come in again a couple of years ago and, um, you know, Darren Beals is the chair now. And I'm also the, the chair of the fellowships program standing committee. Um, and I've been that, I've been the chair for a couple of years now and, and the fellowships program standing committee oversee the fellowships program both in terms of people coming in and undertaking how the program's running and and you know we're looking at um you know trying to advance and develop the program and you know develop into a new specialist training program that that might be um you know more appropriate for improving accessibility and um you know uh, and uh over other clinical streams more and so on so yeah and look that's been great it's uh it's added a whole one of the great things about specialization that brought me not only clinical you know skills is uh the collegiate part of physiotherapy and and particularly the involvement with the australian college of physios and the apa it's brought a whole new dimension actually to my to my professional life in that now i you know, have all these people from all the, you know, right around Australia that I work together with on these on these projects and around this, you know, training programs and and helping the fellows go through uh, the uh, registrars go through the program and and it's great. It's um, a very fulfilling part of my sort of professional career. So you mentioned the program that manages the college specialisation process, but you mentioned another standing committee. Or the, the, sorry, the council. What does the council do separate to your standing committee roles? Yeah, I guess the, the council is is all about you know looking at ad, advancing the college um, strategically and in collaboration, of course, with, with the APA and 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 moving. Try well. They have a lot of roles. They they're also overseeing the um, APA career framework. Which where specialization very much fits in, you know, as being a process to go to milestone four with the framework. So I guess the College Council uh, is is helping to try and with the in collaboration with the APA enable, you know, the career framework to try and set up a, a more a better structure for for physiotherapy careers. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the one of the problems is, of course, is that while well, we have a lot of people entering physiotherapy programs that are Around Australia, the, the physiotherapy career can be quite short. On yeah, you know, and I, I I don't know the most recent stage. At one stage, I think it was six or seven years or something like that. Um, you know, where a lot of people will leave um, physiotherapy and go and do other things. Which is part of the That's reason fine. for this podcast, actually. That I came across that same similar stat less than ten years, and I thought, well, why is that? Is it because people don't understand the diversity of opportunities that physios have got once they've graduated to me it's, it's a you know it's a it's a plethora of opportunities and hopefully by listening to some of these podcasts people go oh i never thought about doing that or there's an area i hadn't yeah. considered exploring or, there's a challenge i'd like to take up myself and yeah that's definitely a large reason for doing this podcast is to sort of show the gamut of things that people can take up if they want to 
And and look, certainly one of the the aims of the career pathway through to specialization is a process where people develop over their their you know careers and with the ability to not only go into any clinical stream you want, but also to be able to enter, you know, leadership and management streams, you know, research streams and um, you know, but with with a with a career structure to do so. Um, and so that that's uh, with a lot of the college council uh, work is, that I've been involved in particular has been around that career framework over the last couple of years and, and trying to enable it. And, um, and there's been a lot of work done and there's still yeah. a long way to go. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great thing to be part of. Mm. Yeah, well, I remember it first being used probably, I don't know, six or seven years ago, the career pathway concept and it's, you know, integration with the, the College of Physiotherapists. Is the college an independent body? Like, does it have its own, we do what we need to do and we're independent of other organisations and we make our own decisions? No, I think, well, now it's very much within the APA. And look, I don't understand the, the entirety of uh, the processes in the background that happen in terms of, you know, agreements. Um, but it's certainly um, a, a part of the Australian Physiotherapy Association and work and work very closely with the Australian Physiotherapy Association to, you know, um, to advance physio and to and for the betterment of members and certainly, yeah, the, the college council's role, a lot of that within that within the APA is 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 to action the career pathway and and and, and allow a a better structure of career for physiotherapists uh, and members of the Australian Physiotherapy Association. Yeah. So no, it is very much a collaboration. It's not, yeah, not off on their own. Yeah. And in regards to like, if we come sort of back to being, you know, you mentioned you've been in private practice in, in a lot of places, you've probably got the longest CV of places you've worked at <laughs> for anyone that I've actually known. What, what's your number one goal as a physio now? Like you see a patient in front of you, like what's your goal? Yeah, and look, it, it, it it's interesting how it's, you know, I, I guess when you trained long enough ago, it was all about, you know, it was more the medical model of I'm going to, what I'm going to do for you sort of thing, you know, I'm going to fix you. And, and you know, now it's all about, you know, collaborative problem solving with patients and, you know, um, and and so I, I, for me, it's, it's all about, um, you know, trying to reassure patients and trying to uh, get them to be responsible for themselves physically and from a rehab perspective and, and them understanding that, you know, I can only provide some guidance and some, you know, some things I might do with my hands and manual therapy might be helpful, but in the long term, the probable more solution is that you become more active and that we, we rehabilitate you, know, you, you functionally and, you know, back to good physical health and, um, you know, that that's also, as you know, a, a very challenging thing to do because you, you're suddenly trying to change behaviour and, you know, physical, the way people physically move is a behaviour <laughs> and it's not just something that you can statically change. And, and so trying to sell to patients the whole, you know, link between the way they move and their, their physical fitness and, and how they feel and, you know, trying to get them on track for the long-term solution, you know, you know, rather than a, thinking there's a short fix, I suppose. And that would just, be, just, as a, just as a thought that just came to me, we're just hosting a course with Jeremy Lewis, so you'll know is very much on the same wavelength here about changing behaviours and, you know, we're getting away from the medical model of fixing ourselves. But I just suddenly thought, are patients ready for this change? Like, do they want to have this change from being fixed to being managed? Well, you know, in many, many ways, uh, that same expectation from, you know, patients can be that I just want you to fix me. Yeah. And you know, look, luckily with a lot of patients, we can do things and with an immediate good effect and that, that helps them. And so it's not that that can't be addressed in some people, but of course, you know, with a lot of people with recurrent disorders and, you know, a lot of spinal conditions, you know, very, you know, it, it is about sort of educating them that look, you might 
have improved here, but we, you know, to stay well for for a long time, we really need you to look after yourself and, you know, trying to find what suits them. You know, with exercise, for example, you know, you might be trying to address their current problems and some impairments you might have found with them. And but in the big picture, you know, saying to them, look, you know, in the long term, we really want you to get back to some you know, regular physical activity. Was there something that you used to do that you enjoy? Or was there something that, you know, you, um, uh, we, we could get you back to that would help you maintain, you know, better phys physical conditioning in the, in the long term? Um, and, you know, because people really have to enjoy or be motivated, as you know, to, to continue on something in the long term. And, and I think the hardest thing is to, sort of find what that would be whether you know whether it's continuing exercise at home by themselves or whether it's you know in some sort of group setting or whether it's pilates or whether it's um you know going to the gym i mean you know that it's not one size fits all you'll say to some patients about maybe going to a gym and and they'll be very much into that whereas you'll say that to some other patients and they'll look at you like there's no way in hell I'm ever going to the gym. And, you know, to try to get them to do that is absolutely fruitless. You know, so it's, it's, um, it's trying to find what really, you know, pushes the button of a patient in terms of saying, yeah, I can get back to that and, and, and going from there. So that, that's what I think the challenging part of, of physio is if you're looking to try to improve the long-term benefits to patients is defining what is going to motivate them to keep going with it. It's interesting. I, um, you know, in just in general physical health, um, me and my wife, who's a sports physio, we used to talk a lot about, you know, when you go into the history of a patient enough, quite often, you know, if you'll find that when they were physically active and, you know, regularly participating in, in, in sport or, um, you know, exercise for fitness, then you know, quite often they're okay. And it's when they stop doing that, you know, and often that coincides with them having children or getting busy at work or both, that that's when their problems started. And you know, to be able to go back and draw that link with them and look, well, that's interesting. You got to that stage of your life and you were okay, but it's it, that has coincided, stopping that has coincided with you developing these neck pains or back problems and, um, you know, once we've addressed these things we've identified here, why can we look at getting back to that, you know, or in some form and, and it is a more long-term solution. Um, I had an honours student, uh, I talked to an honours student about that and, and a couple of years ago and he conducted a systematic review where he looked at, um, was there some sort of link between, you know, participation in exercise and, you know, the, the incidence of neck pain and um, you know, there's lots of studies that look at physical activity, you know, and physical activity is a very big umbrella term that means that sort of any sort of meaningful movement and that through the day, but exercise is a subcategory of physical activity. And I specifically got him to look at studies that looked at exercise with the intention for fitness and sport. So it's, you know, it's in, there's intent that's structured and, you know, um, it's not just physical activity. It's a separate subcategory. And, and look, he found some studies that, that showed a relationship. Again, that, you know, they're weak, weak um, correlations and that, but there was some, you know, some evidence to suggest that, you know, that there might be a nice protective effect of regular particip participation in, in exercise, you know, um, in, you know, either for sport or, or intended for exercise and, and, you know, um, a, a reduced incidence of neck pain. And so I like to bring that information to patients and, you know, say that thinking long-term. If you think back on the last sort of 10 or 20 patients that you've seen, is there a common bit of advice that you find yourself giving them? Well, I guess it is, it is around that. It is, it is around sort of trying to be realistic with them, saying, look, we've found some things here that we can work on. And I think, you know, for the short term, that is going to be helpful for you. But really in the long term, it is all about you looking after yourself and, and self-management and, and then having asked them enough questions to find out, you know, is there any links to physical activity in their past, just like we've talked about, you know, 
and and giving them more of a you know self management perspective on it, which doesn't always work, of course. And you know, we all we all you know you we all try. know. <laughs> yeah, we all know uh, how challenging it is for ourselves to to maintain physical fitness and that it's it's very very difficult you know there's so many things that come into it yes um you know that that accessibility you know social factors that that can influence how successfully people can do that not just their mo- motivation so but it, it, I, I think it's a good message to try to give them you you you, you inform them at least anyway I like the idea too that you can plant a seed. It may not, you know, sprout there and then at that particular point in time, but at least you've opened up the conversation with that person to say that, yeah, here's a short-term thing that we're working on. But realistically, this is the second or the third time that you presented with a similar type presentation. It might be time to consider a bit more of a structured long-term approach and they might not take it on board, but the next time they hurt their back, they might go, hang on. I've been through this cycle before and it's been pointed out to me and there is actually another alternative and that's me being a little bit more dedicated or organized or planned and i'll go back to that physio and say look i like to take like to take you up on that you know offer this time around and i think we've got to keep planting these seeds and just keep reinforcing because as you say at the end of the day that person's got to make a conscious decision about changing their habits and their lifestyle and that takes effort so they need to be ready to do it so if you flip it around then what would you say is your hardest lesson you've learned so far as a physio? Look, and I think that was my first year as a physio in Biloela where I suddenly realised that it's a lot harder than it seemed. <laughs> yeah, you come out of university, you, you know, you're young, you think you know everything. You, oh, you do. You know, you, uh, <laughs> that's your, what you yeah. don't know, you don't know. <laughs> oh, that's it. I, I think I learned less now than what I thought I did in 1994. <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and I, I was in that public health setting at central Queensland and, you know, you were seeing all patients and, you know, uh, really bewildered by, you know, my lack of ability or success with helping some people H- having enough successes to sort of stay in it. You know, but, but, uh, but I remember thinking, gee, this is just really, really challenging. I must be doing something terribly wrong here. And I, and, you know, this is where I, uh, I, I started to really under, appreciate, I really appreciate the value of mentors. And, you know, I was talking about what we're doing in the Australian College of Physios and trying to look at career structure. I think an important part through your career is to have mentors. And of course, you become other people's mentors along the way. Because in that first year, you know, there were three or four people I called a lot to say, you know, I've got this patient's got this, this, and this, and this. I've done this, and it's not working. For those more experienced people to go, look, you know what? Sometimes, sometimes <laughs> there's more to it. It might, you know, you sound like you're trying the right sort of things. Yeah, you know? it might be something that you're not going to help at this stage, <laughs> and um, and that and that's okay. You know, speak to their GP and um and and look at maybe some alternative, you know, pathways they might take. Yeah, you know, that that sort of. Uh, uh, you know, I think the value of mentors for a young physio uh, throughout your career, you've always got mentors, yeah. you know, but, um, you know, it can provide a lot of reassurance that, you know, um, that things aren't as easy to do as might've thought that you might've thought initially. And, um, and I think mentoring is, you know, it seems in medicine to me that, um, you know, men, uh, medicine seems to be structured a lot more on strong mentors as you go through your career. Um, and I, I think that exists in physio to a degree, but it might not exist as systematically as it should. Um, uh, and it's something that we're certainly looking at in the career framework to, you know, put people in contact with mentors very early in their career and hopefully that'll keep them a bit more on track with their professional development and their, you know, satisfaction with being a physio and, and, and inspire them to, to go to the next step of, you know, undertaking more study or, or, or professional development or whatever it might be and keeping them in the profession longer. Hmm. Um, I think that's a key thing. You did your master's at UQ and then you went on, did a PhD as well. What was your thesis title? I had to go and look it up and I 
I, I think you told me you're going to ask me that. In, it, this is supposed to be drilled into your brain in italics, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, you know, it's uh, craniocervical flexion dynamometry. Right. <laughs> so, to the layperson, what what were the, what were the main findings that you got from that that you use in clinical practice? Yeah. Well, what it looked at was it it looked specifically at a um, at, at a dynamometry method, you know, uh, which you know measures muscle forces and in this case torque, you know specifically around the upper neck. And so that craniocervical flexion action, and as you know, there's a craniocervical flexion test and you know, been used clinically for a long time. And, but it, it really was a, a thesis that was about a measure, a, a device and a measurement method that tried to differentiate muscle performance around the upper cervical spine and the lower cervical spine. And so you know that you, know, you can independently move the upper cervical spine and you can independently move the lower and, with a lot of functional movements, it's the upper and lower work together. And, and it's the same, well, it's mostly the same muscles, but there's different muscle actions when you focus movement around the upper cervical spine to the lower. And this was all about specific, yeah, a lot of dynamometry methods had looked specifically, had looked at the neck as a whole. And, and so that PhD, um, we uh, designed some equipment that could look specifically at the upper cervical um, flexors to begin with, and then we had the device do other things. And it was interesting because, it, you know, I sort of built this thing out of aluminium and wood to try to do this, and suddenly it became this commercial product. And it never got anywhere commercially, but, you know, the universities are always keen to protect, you know, um, IP. And, and so suddenly we had, a, we had this device, which, you know, during my PhD, I also helped write an an international patent and um, this thing went down a development line where we you know eventually made it into something that you you did in standing and you could move this axis point from down the lower neck where you could look at all the neck muscles together but measure torque around the cervical thoracic junction and then you could bring it back up to the craniocervical junction which is where the original device was measuring and so you and, th and that that was good actually because Certainly from a clinical perspective, I think the things that I looked at my PhD sort of suggested that, well, looking specifically at the upper cervical spine muscles working is important. And in, when we looked at people with and without neck pain, we found that, you know, that, that they were generally weaker, that they, you know, had deficits in their endurance at, you know, 20% of their maximum, 50%, and they couldn't sustain contractions as, on average, that was uh, as well. When we expand what we did with the device though, we, we looked at a lot of the parameters between the extensors and the flexors. And what we saw was some very different performance parameters between the muscles in the front of the neck and the back of the neck in that, you know, un, in the normal circumstance, in perfectly normal healthy people, males and females, you know, your extensor muscles are nearly twice as strong as your flexor muscles. And that doesn't make them more important or that doesn't, you know, but in the normal person, that's the balance of them. And we think that's, you know, because you're in upright, you know, gravity wants to drop your head forward continuously. And anything we do where we've got our head forward, you know, it's the extensors that are holding the head and neck mechanism up. But it gave us a nice sort of bit of a, you know, a ratio that we could work with, you know, as to what we might need to do with exercise. But the interesting thing we found with the endurance that, um, you know, when you got people up to sustain a contraction at 50% with their flexors and then 50% with their extensors, uh, you know, not only were the extensors much stronger, but they could sustain a 50% contraction for twice as long as well. So they had much high, higher endurance capacity than the flexors. Again, that doesn't make them more important. It just means that under normal circumstances, functionally, those, those muscles have those, you know, profiles and so certainly when, as I always say to treating clinicians, when you, if you're looking at the strength of the flexors and the extensors, don't expect them to be the same. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're normal circumstances. And when you're looking at endurance, don't expect it. When you start prescribing exercise, you know, you, you, you keep those sort of differences in the muscle groups in mind. Um, you know, so I guess in terms of taking that information into clinical practice, um, I guess that's where the interpretation would, would, would come into it. Expect the extensors to be twice as strong, and then also have twice the endurance. So you got to load them up a bit more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, uh, go on. No, no, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> so that's cool. Um, I understand that you also, you know, along this 
I guess, career pathway process of research clinicians, you've sort of developed a bit of an interest in the, the, the term clinician scientist. What does that mean? Uh, and clinician scientists are a term that you, you often hear um, sometimes some in England, they're called clinical academics, um, uh, you know, clinician researchers. Um, there's another term you often hear. Clinician scientists, the American term, well, it's a physician scientist was the, uh, the term in America and clinician scientists have been um, brought in to you know, cover other disciplines besides medicine. And clinician science has, scientists have been a, a, um, you know, a career track uh, in America since the 50s. Um, and so... Yeah, by definition, they're people who have dual qualifications. Uh, so they'll have a clinical qualification and they'll have a, a formal research qualification, you know, usually a PhD. And so not only do they have those dual qualifications, but they also have a career path that covers dual roles of clinical practice and research. Now, they can be very varied as to how they do that, you know, and, um, it, you know, they might perform research in a, in a university and their clinical practice at a completely different place, but, but quite often they might perform both in the same health service, for example, where they'll, they'll treat patients, but they'll also undertake research. Now, that happens in the UK and it happens in Australia as well. We've got, you know, clinician scientists or, um, in Australia and um, uh, in medicine and, and in the allied health disciplines, but it struggles in terms of funding. And, um, you know, I should say that you have clinicians who are involved in research in a whole lot of different levels. And, you know, we have clinicians who do a lot of research who don't have PhDs as well. And, you know, they're, they're very skilled in that. Um, but in the, in the context of what we were talking about with that, the project we've got going, it's looking at those people who have that dual qualification and carry out that, that dual you know, job. And really for the last, you know, since, oh, gee, since 2006 to, you know, recent years, I, I, I sort of led a clinician scientist life where I spent 75% of my week doing research and 25% of my week in clinical practice. And so I had that, that balance. Um, the, um, what we're looking to do, and um, Peter Buttram is uh, at, at Royal Brisbane Hospital is conducting his PhD around this, is we're looking at the clinician scientist workforce in public health because we think that they're a very important component of the workforce because they really draw a nice link between clinical practice and research because they've got a foot in both camp. And that what, what they're known for, clinician scientists, their hallmark is translation of knowledge. And um, so certainly, you know, they're conducting research, so they understand what can be interpreted from research. They understand some of the shortcomings of research and, you know, what can and can't be interpreted, you know. Um, and, and so because they're... Um, but because they're also clinicians, you know, they, they, they've got a good idea of, you know, what would maybe be some very clinically meaningful research projects, uh, you know, and what, what they might need to look at. And so, you know, there's room for everyone and there's an importance to everyone, but they're seen as a nice um, layer to have in your workforce. And so you've got your full-time researchers, your full-time clinicians, and you know, you've got this layer in between who are doing a bit of both. And so, you know, Peter's PhD is really trying to look at, um, you know, what's the value of, of clinician scientists in, in, in the workforce and, um, you know, around trying to gain some leverage for, you know, more funding and and it's a bit, it's quite a big national drive actually in general uh in the nhmrc and you know in medicine are really appreciating starting to appreciate the value of clinician scientists it's a challenging career pathway though and the, and if you look read a lot of the Amer american literature you know where it's been as i say going since the 50s a, a lot of the literature is around the challenges with maintaining a clinician scientist career pathway because often you know, it's difficult to protect your research time. And so if things aren't going well in the health service or there's people away, often these people are pulled in to do clinical work instead of their dedicated research time. That's one of the challenges anyway. But yeah, that's, that's um, 
and, th and that's really revolved a lot around my own experience of, of doing that role for so many years and also my work at Queensland Health where I'm a, um, I'm a clinical academic between University of Queensland and, and Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital and the orthopedic physiotherapy screening clinics and and you know seeing clinicians um, undertake PhDs and then they're left in this position where they're going what do I do now you know I either go to a university and I may never see a patient again if I would go down the lecturing full-time lecturing line or I just return to clinical practice and I may never do another study because I don't have enough time to do it you know whereas this provides them an avenue to if they choose to to um to do to do both and uh so yeah and, and so that's 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 my interest in clinician scientists <laughs> yeah <laughs> well I mean, I, I have to say, I fall into that, that category very, you know, very easily having done the PhD and sort of working full time. And I guess I got that little disadvantage of being 800 kilometers from the nearest university as well, which makes that process a little bit more challenging in that sort of sense. But yeah, it's, it's a, it's a thing to consider. And I, I think, you know, regardless of what happens, it's it's also understanding that the more diversity I've seen have had in my life as far as professionally, it's certainly the more interest I've maintained in the profession. So whether you do keep going along that pathway or you just maintain a light touch on it, it certainly keeps that diversity process going. What do you find challenging about working in big organisations like UQ and Royal Brisbane? Yeah. Well, look, I, I think that you know, it's making sure you meet um, meet their, well, demands is a bit of a strong word, but making sure you address what they're after. And I, look, I've been very lucky. I've had extremely supportive, very collaborative um, bosses on both sides. Um, but, you know, in the university side, there's a lot of, a lot of teaching. Um, my job changed uh, three years ago when I, a couple of years ago, so the, the conjoint position that I had between UQ and Royal Brisbane Hospital was a research focused position, but I never, I never really ran it as a research focused position because I, I was 25% of my week, I'd be in clinical practice. Um, and, I, and I was doing a lot more teaching also because of my long standing involvement with the master's course and particularly when Gwen retired and then there was more, you know, teaching in the master's course. and. Um, so I never really ran it like a research focused job. And so I sort of asked for it to be converted to a clinical academic position, which allowed that bigger mix. Um, and so look, between the two organizations, uh, you know, I, I think I've been very lucky in that I've had very understanding bosses on both sides who, who re appre you know, appreciate I wanted to keep active in those roles. Um, you know, it's been fine for me, you know, because kept the research side going, the teaching side going, you know, at Royal, they, they want both of those, but they also want you to support, um, you know, clinicians doing projects and try to, and capacity build. And, and it's been good that I've had a couple of PhD students at, at, within the hospital system who have now, you know, come up through the ranks and they're, you know, very much they're the research coordinators within the, within the, the department and they're, they're absolutely terrific at, um, the, at the grassroots level, getting clinicians involved in, in research and, and, you know, doing uh, very doable research projects that they can actually, you know, um, achieve within their clinical practice without, you know, um, and so, uh, yeah, I think the, the biggest challenge with the diff two different organisations is just making sure you try to address what each want. The other big part of my job at Royal and uh, Brisbane, but it's also a big part of my job at UQ, particularly now I've got a bit more senior in, in that role, is engagement and it's bringing the two together, you know, and it's so it's introducing people, you know, within the public health system to, to the academics who have certain expertise that might help them out in projects they want to do or, and, and vice versa, having the, the academics know uh, you know what projects are happening at in, within Queensland Health, and inviting them over and, and getting them all together to talk about potential things they might do together. So engagement, 
is a big part of what my job now between those two. And so it, it's married for, married very nicely together for me for yeah over the past. And can you see those roles changing for you over the next few years, or is it? Uh, no, not 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 in the foreseeable future. Uh, I I'm very happy in that position. It's evolving. Um, it's changing, um, uh, and and it's it's a you know with a different focus to what it had say you know five years ago six years ago it's um you know very fulfilling and and, and I, I certainly am very happy in that position yeah now we all live in the old COVID world now like where we are as we were talking before we came on to record that it's not affected us much here in Esperance in South WA but how's the COVID affected you professionally in the past 18 months well, I mean, the, the thing that it's affected for me is, is the teaching and, you know, and, and research, um, uh, you know, but teaching has been turned around and, you know, everyone's seen, you know, at schools and at universities and, and everywhere where, you know, it's very much disrupted what was the normal approach. And, you know, we were, universities were, you know, progressing to a lot more online platforms as it was, you know, uh, already, but suddenly there was this huge demand, and 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 you know, of course, it was difficult. It, it, uh, for I, I think you know, I, I'm predominantly involved in the masters courses, and so it's a smaller cohort. Certainly for the, you know, for the people who are involved in undergraduate teaching, where they've got hundreds of students and people in hundreds in clinical placements at any one point in time, you know, it's been a continual evolving process and then problem solving. It's amazing to watch them actually. The, um, I've sat in awe uh, at staff meetings at UQ, listening to the teaching team talk about how they're what they're going to do and how they're going to address this issue. And yeah, uh, absolutely amazing that they they've been able to graduate students as you know and the way they have. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, what it has done is opened a lot of people's eyes to the way things can be done, you know, successfully. And that some things can be done better than what they were done in other older ways. And so, as as we come out of COVID, hopefully soon, we we um, you know there'll be a bit more of a hybrid approach. I think where there'll be a lot of good things that people will want to keep. And so, yeah, certainly it's been a disruption, but it's been you know very in insightful in a lot of ways. Research, look, it depends on what research you're doing. If you're doing face-to-face -face research, and you know, many years ago I was doing very laboratory-based research of you know, looking at you know, physical impairments where you're face-to-face, -face, you know, a lot of that has been disrupted um, dramatically for people, of course. Um, but you know, if you're doing qualitative research, you know, certainly systematic reviews and things, but yeah, you know, surveys and you know, you a lot of health services research. You can you can still do um, very very well, and we, you know a lot of the research I've done over the last ten years has been a lot of health services research, as well, particularly in the orthopedic physiotherapy screening clinics and multidisciplinary services that we have statewide um, around Queensland, and where we you know we're looking at a lot of things around you know stratified care and all those where where you can do. Yeah, they might involve interviews and surveys and that, and you can, you know, you can do those fairly disrupt, you know, without being disrupted. And so, people have had to become a lot more uh, clever with with what they do in research to try to continue. Um, you know, certainly PhDs now, people coming into PhDs, you, you have a COVID plan, you know, and you you make sure you're not trying to just depend on face to face stuff because it's an uncertain future of with that for the you know the next bit but um yeah so look it when i say it's disrupted things it's disrupted what we were doing but people have certainly worked out as you know other ways of doing things and getting around it so. yeah and you've had a you've had a lot of variety in the different types of work and location and what you've done over time has there ever been a time when you didn't want to be a physio oh look i think n never seriously uh I think like most people, you think, you know, um, gee, should I go and do medicine or, um, you know, should I do something else? And I thought about it never very seriously. Uh, no, I'm pretty happy with what, what way I've gone. Um, 
you know, I'm uh, never really seriously thought about doing anything else. Yeah. yeah. I know that's boring. Rick boring answer but <laughs> well I, I mean i think that's that speaks to the um, opportunities that physio provides too like yeah, a lot of yeah. physios have said oh i wanted to be a med doctor and i sort of i thought about that seriously myself and i thought did i want to be a doctor and i thought well i deliberately chose physio over medicine but there have been times where aspects of medicine have attracted me um but yeah. the diversity of opportunity within the physio profession to me is just is wide open so I think it's more about exploring what you can achieve yourself rather than jump ship and try and do something completely different. I mean, that's my take. Lots of people have done medicine and they've enjoyed it and that's, that's, that's good for them. But I don't think because we're unhappy with our physio that that means we're not exploring the, 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 um, the potential that the profession can offer us. Mm. In your career so far, Sean, and it's obviously got a long way to go yet, what three things sort of stand out for you as being highlights? Yeah, look, um, uh, I, and you know, th there's there's different. I think that happens in different phases of your career. So early on, the thing that really stuck out to me about being a physio was it was a tremendously flexible job, where you really could just you, you weren't stuck in one position. Place. you really could go and work anywhere you want really and um there, there seemed to be an abundance of jobs and um you know uh, that and if you're willing to go out of your hometown you could find you know work anywhere and, and it so i mean the flexibility the ability to travel with it and to explore new places and all that uh, for me early days that really stood out as a a, a great you know at, aspect of, of physiotherapy you know look uh i think coming into the middle stage of my career to you know to now the collegiate feeling i have and that that's i brought that up when i talked about the australian college of physios and the work being part on the council and you know the work with the fellowships program standing committee and the, the um you know the, helping the registrars go through fellowship and the career pathway and all that work I, I do with the AP, you know, where we have all these people we work with in the, who are APA staff members and, and other, you know, college council members and committee members around the, Australia, that real collegiate feeling, that's a, to me, a tremendously fulfilling part of my work. That's all volunteer work too, by the way. That's yeah, absolutely. Where, you know, not I think paid that's... That. Yeah, it's all volunteer, it's all volunteer work and, you know, gee, over the last two years, I, I would be on Zoom calls, you know, at least one night every week, I reckon, you know, with those. And, and they're a lot of work, but gee, it's a, it's a great feeling to do. it. Uh, and so that's been a standout for me. I think the other part, which is a standout for me, and this probably comes a little bit with um, getting in a more senior position, I guess, and, you know, on, on a few different levels here, is that the, the impact that you can have on others? Um, uh, on other people's careers and, and, and particularly, you know, uh, in the teaching sphere that where you, you know, you get to know these generations of students, you know, PhD students as well, you really get to know these people well over those three years, you know, uh, well, it's at least three years sometimes, but you really get to know them well, you know, and, and you really feel you have a bit of an, an impact on their life and, and, and all of that. And, you know, so, but I guess that's, um, you know, it's interesting when you, I've, I've heard podcast people talking about being educators and that, and, you know, they, they, they said, you know, when you first become an educator, you, you, you're interested, you want to be the great, the best clinician you can be. And you think that education and, and that is all about just telling people as much information as you can, but really as you go along in it, you understand that it's, a, it's more about helping them to, you know, self-reflect and to be independent learners and, and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, the other, yeah, that's third standout for me would be, you know, as you get more senior that you, through your interactions, no matter whether it's in the clinics, you know, whether it's in your clinical practice or whether it's in a university or public health setting or whatever it might be, is that ability to impact perhaps other people's careers or, yeah. Um, their pathway in physiotherapy so 
Yeah. Yeah. I think it's worth just acknowledging there all that work that volunteers do do. Like it's our association yeah. is run on volunteers pure and simple and there's a massive amount of um, dedication and people willing to allocate their life to the profession. I, they, they call them volunteers, but I don't like that word. I like the, it's, to me, it's more of a, a, a deliberate decision to contribute to the profession outside of their own benefit. And I think that all those people and all those committees, you know, they really need a big pat on the back from every other physio because that's who's benefiting from their decision to help out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, if you could jump into a TARDIS and borrow Doctor Who for a couple of minutes and you zoom back to your younger self, what sort of three bits of advice would you give to the young Sean O'Leary just starting out as a physio? Yeah. Well, Drink first thing I have to think about <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Well, I did too much of that early on. <laughs> no, yeah, not to believe you're going to fix everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, first of all, you know, to not, not be so hard on yourself when you're um, look, but obviously, too, that drives, you know, uh, early failures. And this is a teaching thing, too, that I've come to understand. I've read relevant literature about it. And, you know, early failures um, uh, with patients or early failures in education or whatever, you know, can be quite damaging to people if it's not handled well, because it can get people to lack confidence and not believe in themselves and that but but if you if you can turn it around for people and use it as incentive to inspire them to you know do more professional development and education then it, it it can be the thing that really helps and so you know for me early on um you know like i talked about in those first couple of years and gee over in england too treat working in the you know nhs over in england where there's a lot of complex patients and challenging and thinking to yourself what am i doing wrong here this, i must be doing something terribly wrong <laughs> you know um so i'd go back and say just understand that you know there's lots of things involved here and that while well, you need to keep trying to work it out and problem solve and get better sometimes it, it might not be your fault <laughs> it's, it's it's something that everyone experiences uh I think it would be not to be impressed by people who um, claim they can fix everything too. I always think, you know, you come across all sorts as you go through and when you're younger, younger and impressionable, you can, you know, get wrapped up in some things that are the unexplainable side. Um, and so, you know, to, I think everyone's worth listening to, but you need to be able to um, take that information, make your own judgments about it. And, and, you know, as to what you think about it and, Look, um, and I guess, you know, for me, you know, follow the path I have. I, you know, I'm pretty happy with the path I've followed. And, um, yeah, so probably wouldn't have much more uh, advice myself. Later on in our conversation, Sean just wanted to make sure he mentioned to his younger self to marry the same lovely lady. Advice myself. <laughs> Be more things out of my profession I advise myself not to have done. But... <laughs> And, and, and now you've come back to present time and now you've got the chance to look forward on the horizon. Where would you like to see our profession going in sort of the next five years? I, I was sort of saying, it. well, it's it's doing the things that I'm currently involved in with the, the Australian College of Physiotherapists with the whole career framework and, and a nice structured career for physiotherapists so that when when people are in their undergraduate training, that they there's acknowledgement that, and they know that there's a nice career structure there for them that they can then continue on and learn and follow a pathway if they choose to you know um so for me that's where i and i'm very happy to say i'm actively involved in trying to to set that set that in action and, so and on, that, that's where, on that sort of pro, like where where is that process at like if you were to give a like a little one minute synopsis of the career pathways for physios now where are we at with that whole process well certainly there's been a lot of planning and thinking how it logistically happens and, and thinking about where specialization sits in that process and because a lot of it is trying to uh um ensure that people remain active learners um when they leave that they don't just leave their physio their undergraduate training go okay i've done it all now 
yeah, I might just do one professional development course a year and that's it sort of thing. But to give them the resources and the, under, the, the capacity to be continuous self-learning learners, uh, independent self-regulated learners, is, um, and mentoring is a big part of that. And so where we're at is, is trying to work out, you know, how we can get people um, along that pathway and then as many people as we can to, to take on specialization and to try to get that. And, and so that's been a big emphasis to try to get more specialists in, in all different streams though. And as you were talking about and emphasizing, understanding that it's not just about the clinical streams, you know, they can go down that pathway in leadership. They can go down that pathway in research, you know, um, and an education will be another one in the, in the future. So yeah, uh, COVID has been very disruptive to it, of course, because everyone's had to do other things. And, but certainly now there's some, been some really, really lovely collaboration between you, uh, not you, uh, the APA and, um, uh, and the college around right now over these next couple of years, let's try and um, pilot some of those things. And um, let's, let's try to move it ahead. So, so hopefully we're not too far. It's a massive task. It's a massive task. And, and a lot of it has been, you know, um, APA staff together with, with volunteers. Um, who, who, and, and so it, it, it was always going to be a slow process. But hopefully in the next you know, couple of years, we'll, we'll actually enable some of those things. Yeah, great. Well, thanks Sean, so much for joining us on Physio Plus 10 and sort of exploring your journey as a physio and all the ups and downs, but also all the massive contributions you have provided to our profession, not just only academically, but by teaching and with your research and also just getting involved in the professional side of the profession. So, you know, I, thanks very much because I've been a bit, I did a bit my early years, but I've certainly not done as much in the latter years. And I do appreciate all the stuff and time that people put into our profession. So on behalf of myself and everyone else that's not doing anything, thank you very much for your contribution and thanks heaps for joining us on Physio Plus 10. Thank you, Doug. I've enjoyed it. It's been great. Thank you.